Our next guest is Gail McLaughlin. Uh, she is running for lieutenant governor in California. That election is on June 5th, uh, as I've probably told the audience a million times already. Uh, Gail, um, you won about 78 different awards, um, uh, all for doing wonderful things like human rights awards, um, Day of Peace Award, Award for Excellent Leadership. Uh, I love this one, Best Politician Against All Odds. <laughs> so that's that's great, and you're doing something with Jane Sanders now, and you're endorsed by all the progressive groups, uh, Our Revolution National, 38 uh, chapters of that, the California Green Party, et cetera. So I like that, by the way, of the different people you're endorsed by, not only Ralph Nader, but Jimmy Dore. Um, <laughs> so that's clear. Who's the real progressive in the race is clear, okay? So we can skip all those questions. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, so let's go to uh, the the reason why all those people are backing you, and and one of the reasons is the work you did at the Richmond Progressive Alliance, and that's an amazing story and one that is that not enough people know about. So can you uh, tell us what happened in Richmond? Um, what was the background? What was your role in it? And then what was the results that you guys got? Right, yeah, first of all, thank you, Cheng, for having me on the show. It's a real privilege to be here. Um, yes, we formed a progressive alliance in Richmond because we realized back in 2003 that the whole city council at that time was in the hands of Chevron. Chevron had purchased the whole city council, funded their campaigns, and intimidated them all. So everything was done by the corporate model, and nothing was changing in Richmond. It was spiraling down, downward. Um, we had a lot of crime, a lot of pollution, a lot of health problems. And so we had had enough. We were a group of ac activists in the city, local activists from different parties, some Green Party members, some progressive Democrats, some having no party affiliation. And we had had enough and we decided to become the leaders we were waiting for. So we came together as a diverse, um, inclusive, year in, year out organization, progressive corporate free, taking no corporate money. And we decided to build local political power. And we did this by building a local movement and by running candidates for office without any corporate money. And I was the first corporate free council member elected in 2004. And then I was elected mayor in 2006 and reelected mayor in 2010. And then after I termed out as mayor, I ran for city council and won that race in 2014. All ran and won without corporate money. But I wasn't the only one. Um, by 2016, we have five corporate free council members sitting on the city council out of seven total. So that's a super majority. So we really, really did um, change the composition of the council. And we did this in spite of Chevron spending millions to try and defeat us. In 2014, Chevron spent three and a half million dollars to try and defeat me and, and other progressives. And we all won and all the Chevron candidates lost. But we did this to change the quality of life for our residents. I mean, that's why we, we changed the composition of the council. And we were able to um, increase the minimum wage to $15 an hour, pass rent control, reduce crime dramatically. We have a 75% reduction in, in homicides over the eight years I was mayor. Um, we limited Chevron's pollution. We got over $100 million in additional taxes from Chevron, and we became part of a community choice energy program where our residents get cleaner and greener and cheaper sources of electricity. So these are just some of the things we were able to do by forming an alliance and working together, you know, coming together based on our progressive values and setting party affiliation aside. Gail, uh, it's it's not hyperbole to say that you're an American hero. and. And uh, now uh, this is another race uh, on Tuesday that uh, I'm going to be on the edge of my seat for, and and they are spending millions of dollars against you. But you've been there before, right? So yeah, we're used to that. <laughs> yeah, but now this is on a statewide level, and California is gigantic. And That's so, true. and I like the word you're using or the phrase you're using, corporate free. 
Right. Uh, and there's a bunch of corporate free candidates and I can't wait to see how you guys are gonna do and it's not easy. But I wanna stay on Richmond for a second. So a sure. couple of amazing things there. You know, the Republicans always say, you know, you have to keep giving tax cuts and all the benefits to corporations that eventually trickle down to you. If you dare take anything away, they'll run away and uh, and then you'll have nothing and you'll be broke, etc. But you guys taxed Chevron an extra hundred million dollars in just one mid-sized city. So sure. did they run away? Uh, did all the jobs leave Richmond? Nope, they're still there. They're still operating. Um, they're still, you know, unfortunately polluting our community, even though we have limited the pollution. We we need to do more work and we need the air quality district to, to really uh, do more for limiting the pollution. And the state needs to require um, refinery cities to, um, you know, limit that pollution and, and cause refineries to stop polluting our communities totally. So, you know, they stay in place because, you know, they have all their equipment, they have their infrastructure, they have a great place right on the bay. Richmond is right on the bay, right across from uh, San Francisco. And uh, they're not going anywhere. You know, what we want them to do is eventually um, uh, switch to renewables or if they leave, you know, we'll find another good business to uh, a, a real good business, one that doesn't harm our community to um, situate itself there. But I love that you called their bluff and proved their lie. Uh, my favorite example of that was when the Republican governor of Pennsylvania said uh, that if he didn't give tax cuts to the fracking companies, they would go somewhere else. Yeah. The shale yeah. gas is under Pennsylvania. Where would they go to get it? Right? That's right. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's preposterous, right? You know, uh, it, it so, really is. and you know, just a, a point here is that. There has not been a new refinery built in the United States since the 1970s. And that's because cities, communities don't want uh, refineries built in their city. So, you know, it's, they're not going to just get up and leave. You know, they're, they're where they are. And we just have to keep fighting back and doing right, you know, for our communities and for the planet. And that's, you know, fighting these big oil giants is what it's all about. So, the other amazing stat from there was that you, as you pointed out there, you do reduced homicide by 75% over eight years when you were mayor. Mm -hmm. How in the world did you do that? Yeah. So we did that by addressing the root causes of crime. You know, what a novel notion. You know, instead of saying, you know, the police have to stamp out crime, we knew that wasn't the way to do it. People um, end up in crime uh, lifestyles because they haven't had opportunities for the most part, um, especially, you know, when we're talking about street crime. And so when you give people opportunities, they're able to make a, a healthy lifestyle for themselves. So some of the things we did uh, was set up an office of neighborhood safety with outreach teams into a neighborhood's hardest hit by crime. And these outreach teams were, um, were made up of formerly incarcerated individuals who had turned their lives around and they could relate to the young people who were involved in crime in our neighborhoods. And they talked to them and they told them, you know, you have to um, you know, move in a different direction and we'll help you, we'll provide you with services for job training and help you get your GED or substance abuse programs. And they really mentored these young people and quelled the violence as a result. So that was one way. We also were able to um, put more and more programs in our community centers. We had an award-winning uh, green job training program. And as a result of that, we became number one in the Bay Area for solar installed per capita. So we really you know, stepped out and gave opportunities Opportunities. We also had a community-involved police um, uh, police department because we hired a community-involved police chief who got some national attention by holding a Black Lives Matter sign during a rally in Richmond. You know, myself and the vice mayor were with him, so uh, we really, you know, did some cutting-edge stuff. Um, and it was, you know, really great to have a police department that was showcasing a different way um, rather than what we see all over the country. You know too much of the brutality that we see. Man, it's amazing what you can do when you break corporate chains and right wing mythology. Uh, it turns out you can solve crime, you can solve uh, all these different issues and actually look out for the community if you come from the community. So one more question about what you guys did there because 
one topic after another was one miracle after another and all the things that they they said weren't possible that you all did uh so you kept homeowners in their home when their mortgages were underwater and the yeah. banks came for them how'd you do right. that so this is this was a real innovative program um about 50% of mortgages in Richmond were underwater during the foreclosure crisis. And we said to the big banks, you know, um, you need to reduce the principles for our homeowners, modify the loans. Economists of all political stripes said that's the way to address the housing crisis, reduce the principles in line with the home value because the home values had went down so much. And so the banks said, no, we can't do that. These are, you know, these loans have been pooled and there are investors all around the world. We can't get them together to agree on how to modify these. So sorry, we can't do it. So we said, well, if you can't do it, um, sell the loans to us, the city, and we will reduce the mortgages uh, for our home. And if you won't sell them to us voluntarily, we'll acquire them by the city's uh, power of eminent domain. And then we will reduce the principles and put the loan right back in the hands of the homeowner, keeping them in the home all along. So that was the uh, the effort that we put forward. It got national attention. Um, we weren't able to move forward with the program because, and this is a reason why we need corporate free elected officials, Wall Street got to Congress and, you know, Congress is often controlled by these uh, big financial interests. And they put forward a bill that said any public entity that acquires a mortgage by eminent domain can get no um, insur mortgage insurance, no government insurance for the mortgage. And we needed to have uh, insurance for the mortgages. So that forced us to set the program aside. But because we had fought so hard and pushed so hard, um, Wall Street did voluntarily do some principal reduction, so we were able to gain some success, but not as much as we had wanted. So yeah. it's a long-term struggle, Gail, as you know. Uh, you shouldn't run for lieutenant governor. You should run for boss, because that's what you are. <laughs> uh, and, and I wish Obama was paying attention when he said, "Oh, there's nothing we could do." It turns out there's a lot you could try and a lot you could do uh, to get results for people. So fi now, final thing is about this particular race for lieutenant governor in California. Uh, how much money are your uh, more establishment Democratic opponents spending in the primary? They are spending millions of dollars. One of my opponents, is, her father uh, owns a big um, development company and he put in $5 million into a super PAC, a super PAC that's sponsored by the California Medical Association, which opposes single payer um, SB 562, which is the California single payer health care bill. Um, so he put in $5 million for his daughter uh, to win this race. She herself put in two and a half million dollars of her own money. She also is uh, has been the president of this development company. So, you know, the way I see it, you know, to have a father put in five million dollars to try and buy his daughter a lieutenant governor's seat is really outrageous. And, uh, you know, there are other candidates that are, are just funded heavily by the insurance companies and the pharmaceutical companies. And there's a Republican candidate that's putting in millions dollars of his own money, uh, $500,000 a day. He's already put in millions of dollars. So there are millions of dollars in this race. My campaign is unique because we're building from the grassroots up. We're using social media. Um, we have more social media engagements um, than most candidates, certainly, you know, a lot more than all my rivals. Um, you know, we we actually were the winner of uh, social media engagements uh, on some weeks. Other times, we are maybe two, you know, the second winner or something. But we are really, really doing well in this social media world, which we think is the way to win. And you know, winning by reaching out, winning by field campaigning, and winning by addressing the issues. So I'll give people a sense of context there. Um, so uh, Allison Harson is running for governor in California. I'm sorry, senator in California, and uh, and she has more social media engagement than the other 31 people running for senator, including Senator Feinstein. Uh, Gail has even more social engagement than Allison does. 
<laughs> so, yeah. amazing, amazing stuff. That's grassroots. And on Tuesday, uh, we're going to find out, and we don't know. We don't know uh, if if that grassroots activism uh, can overpower five hundred thousand dollars a day in advertising, right? right. And right. yeah, and that's the we, battle we're in. So, absolutely, absolutely. And you know, it's um, it's. It, I'm very optimistic because we we've worked so hard. We saw what Bernie did. We saw how he his grassroots efforts snowballed. Our grassroots efforts are snowballing. So we feel really really optimistic. And um, you know, lots of people are are working hard to make this happen. All right. So if you want to help Gail uh, and any right minded American would, uh, GailforCalifornia.org. You see where my perspective is, uh, and and then you see the lo links for donations and volunteers. The election is next Tuesday, June 5th. So get involved in the campaign, galeforcalifornia.org. But most importantly, go vote. Go have everyone in your family and your friends uh, vote. Because if you're going to be corporate free, the only way to do it is people power. And uh, if anybody knows that, it's definitely Gail McLaughlin. So, Gail, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. So much, and everybody keep organizing. You know, when I'm elected, I'll keep that organizing effort going. We got to make it happen. That's how we make change in this country, and it's certainly in the state of California.